The next item of business is statement by Paul Wheelhouse on Energy Efficient Scotland. The Minister will take questions at the end of his statement, so there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call on Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, ten minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, today we published three consultation analysis reports for Energy Efficient Scotland, and this is an opportunity to update Parliament on, on that, our recent discussions and intended next steps. As we develop Energy Efficient Scotland, the Scottish Government is continuing to invest heavily. By the end of 2021, we will have allocated over £1 billion since 2009 on tackling fuel poverty and improving energy efficiency. Uh, since 2008, 1 million measures have been delivered through a range of UK and Scottish uh, programmes to over 1 million households. When scrutinising the draft climate change plan, Parliament asked the uh, Scottish Government to set out a credible framework uh, for decarbonising the heat supply. So in May, we set out an ambitious yet credible plan to make our buildings more efficient. A plan that would make it the norm to invest in energy efficiency with the aim that all Scotland's homes should, be ach should achieve at least EPC Band C by 2040. These proposals are just the first step. We will do more, but we're starting in the right place, focusing on energy efficiency. Many of those responding to the recent consultation supported our proposals and agreed that a 2040 target is the right one. Uh, South Lanarkshire Council noted that, and I quote, 2040 target allows 20 years to address building improvements, which ought to provide sufficient time to plan for and fund any necessary improvements were technically feasible and cost effective. However, I also know there were those who shared the view with those in this chamber that an earlier target should be set, suggesting 2030, 2032 and 2035 as alternatives. Arguments can be made for going faster, but we are concerned that moving too quickly would not only increase uh, and, inf and cause an inflationary effect on prices per intervention, but this would also be potentially detrimental to the Scottish economy in driving an increased need to import equipment and installers uh, from outside Scotland rather than developing and growing locally based supply chains here at home. Uh, our approach would better allow us to seize the opportunity for our local supply chain, bringing local economic and social benefits. It may also undermine, uh, underline uh, public con confidence if we were to uh, do so, uh, move too fast. And it's imperative that we have credible, deliverable proposals and can take the public with us. Let us not forget that when combined with uh, investment in our non-domestic premises, it's anticipated that total public, private and third sector investment will potentially reach £12 billion by 2040. In the recent progress report to, to the UK, uh, UK Committee on Climate Change, praised Energy Efficient Scotland, noting, and again I quote, the Scottish approach represents best practice in a number of areas, including setting standards well in advance, with a regulatory backstop for owner-occupied homes and a statutory underpinning. This provides a strong example of an effective policy package to drive emissions reductions and other outcomes, including fuel poverty. Now, uh, unquote. Those calling for an accelerated target have yet to set out an alternative credible delivery plan uh, that overcomes the risks and missed opportunities. But, presiding officer, we recognise there is support out there for faster action and we believe that it's only right that we consider this. As such, we will publish a consultation in January on how the programme could be accelerated and uh, seeking views on the risks and how others believe these can be overcome. Before I go on, I must mention fuel poverty and the important role that Energy Efficient Scotland will play. My colleague Kevin Stewart introduced the Fuel Poverty Target Definition and Strategy Scotland uh, Bill in June, which sets a target that by 2040, no more than 5% of households are in fuel poverty. And we are listening. For example, we've introduced new low carbon heat and enabling measures into the Warmer Homes Scotland programme, and we continue to pilot and discuss greater flexibilities with our rural and islands authorities to strengthen the design and delivery of their area-based schemes. I'm also pleased to inform Parliament that next year Mr Stewart and I will begin work to prepare a suite of legislation to support the delivery of energy efficient Scotland. This will include primary legislation, but given limited parliamentary time and the additional pressures being placed on committees by Brexit, we will, where appropriate, also look to use powers already available to the Scottish Government, for example, under the Climate Change Scotland Act 2009 and the Energy Act. In the new year, uh, Kevin Stewart will publish draft regulations for minimum energy efficiency standards in the private rented sector, and will look to introduce these to Parliament ahead of summer recess, with the aim of these coming into force from the 1st of April 2020. And I can confirm also that my colleague Kevin Stewart will also bring forward proposals later next year, putting more meat on the bones for the owner-occupied sector in terms of the encouragement and mandatory phases that we have set out. And to provide a strategic approach to energy efficient Scotland, we have proposed that local authorities should produce local heat and energy efficiency strategies, or LHEs for short. These will be the foundation of energy efficient Scotland at a local level, identifying opportunities for energy efficiency improvements and heat decarbonisation across Scotland. 
Uh, having LTs in place will help de-risk investment by providing invaluable market information and give Scottish businesses the confidence to invest in people, skills and equipment, thereby giving a clear signal on the long-term commitment to energy efficient Scotland. Presiding officer, due to the comprehensive picture that will be uh, provided by LEs and their benefits, we believe it's optimal for delivery against our climate and economic objectives that LEs should be placed on a statutory basis. But saying that, I do recognise that there are resource implications for this and that local authorities would require additional support. And that is why I'm committed, uh, along with Kevin Stewart, to working with our partners, COSLA and local authorities. And I'll say more about this partnership later. To understand uh, what support they need and enabling us both to understand the circumstances in which LHEs could be most suitably placed on a statutory footing. We've already funded 23 local authorities to undertake LHEs pilot projects and I'm committed to supporting the remaining nine local authorities to undertake similar pilots. Alongside these pilots, which are crucial to learning for our future approach, we will shortly establish a working group to pub, uh, produce guidance on the development and implementation of LHEs with the intent the group reports in its first quarter of 2019. Presenting officer, I briefly want to touch on the supply of low carbon heat before coming on to my conclusion. Right now, the majority of our heat is supplies using carbon-based fuels, and we have a significant challenge ahead if 45% of heat demand is to come from low-carbon fuels by 2032. It is vital that we consider the advice of the Committee on Climate Change and other experts as we respond to this challenge and to ensure the deployment of low-carbon heat is consistent with the long-term decarbonisation goals. And that's why we're focusing on rolling out low-carbon heat where it makes sense, uh, regardless of long-term decisions. The Scottish Government currently runs a number of schemes to pilot test and support low carbon heat, including the Low Carbon uh, Transition Programme, the District Heating Loan Fund and our Home Energy Scotland Resource Efficient Scotland Loan Schemes. And in order to prepare Scotland for life after the UK-wide renewable heat incentive, I can confirm we'll shortly be starting work to strengthen our policy framework for low carbon heat. This will have a specific focus in off-gas areas and will begin with a call for evidence to be published in early 2019, which will sit alongside and complement our work to develop a draft bioenergy action plan. And whilst we further develop our policy on low carbon heat, I can confirm it's our intention to prepare legislation to introduce regulation and licensing for the district heating sector, which is a devolved responsibility. This regulation will be commensurate with the scale of this emerging market and I'll shortly commission an advisory group to inform the development of a licensing regime and associated uh, license conditions. Our leadership on this issue has been recognised by stakeholders here in Scotland and from further afield and the Competition and Markets Authority, a respected economic regulator, has agreed with our assessment that the market would benefit from regulation. We're also investigating the potential for granting permitted development rights and whaleys, putting district heating developments on a similar footing with other utilities. And as part of January's consultation, we will seek evidence on whether further incentives can be made available to the sector within the constraints of competition and human rights laws. However, under the current devolution settlement, it's not within our gift to make consumer protection provisions to ensure that customers of heat networks receive the same protections as others, uh, users of other utilities. However, I'm having positive discussions with my counterpart, Claire Perry, the UK's Minister of State for Energy and Clean Growth, as we look to agree how the CMA's recommendations can be implemented as a coherent package for the benefit of consumers as is intended. I want to close today with an important note on partnership. Achieving our vision will require the Scottish Government to work in partnership with a variety of sectors and organisations. As I mentioned earlier, local government is a key partner. Earlier this month, I met with councillors Heddle and Witham, uh, COSA spokespeople on respectively environment and economy and community well-being, to discuss local government's key role in steering the shape of and delivery of energy efficient Scotland. We have agreed to strengthening this partnership by establishing a high-level strategic group in order to embed our commitment to active partnership, shared risk and joint strategic decision-making. In conclusion, presiding officer, let me be clear, any complaints that Scottish uh, government is just kicking the can further down the road with more consultation uh, cannot be further from the truth. While we work together to identify and plan for our transition to a low carbon future, we are continuing to invest heavily to energy efficient Scotland. And as I said earlier, by 2021, this government will have allocated one billion pounds to energy efficiency since 2009, with over 500 million pounds being spent in this parliamentary session alone. But we have also an obligation to the people of Scotland to get this right. And that is why we're investing in maintaining and nurturing a dialogue with individuals, organisations, representative bodies and colleagues right across this chamber. And I look forward to taking questions. Thank you very much. 
The Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement, and I'll allow around 20 minutes for that. Um, would members who wish to ask a question please press the request to speak buttons? And I call Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of a statement uh, and note members to my register of interest around renewable energy. Now, it is with huge regret that whilst the settled will of this Scottish Parliament on the 10th of May 2018 was to bring forward the target for all homes to reach EPCC rating from 2040 to 2030, yet again the SNP is choosing to ignore this chamber when it suits them. So, Perhaps when the Cabinet Secretary and Mr Stewart begin preparing their suite of legislation next year, they will do well to note the cross-party support for all the amendments lodged that day. Now, complaints that the Scottish Government are just kicking the can further down the road is exactly the truth with just more consultation <coughs> and working groups. And under the fig leaf of inflationary prices, the truth is that this Government is going to commit households to a further decade of wasted energy and environmental costs. So can the Cabinet Secretary provide the evidence that his proposal is less detrimental than the one wished by this Parliament? Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and uh, I thank uh, Mr. Mr. Burnett for his unintended promotion um, of me there. But, uh, but I certainly do recognise that um, you know, there's, uh, certainly Parliament's vote in, in, in May was a significant one in, in the sense that we obviously had a, a good debate around Energy Efficient Scotland route map. We have been consulting on that route map over the summer and I, I would hope Mr Burnett would recognise that we need to listen to the evidence that's been submitted to us. It is not universally accepted that acceleration of, uh, of the programme would be to the uh, benefit of either the outcomes that are being sought or indeed the uh, development of local supply chains. As I've said in my statement, there are clear voices uh, who have responded in the consultation to suggest that we should actually take the timescales that were originally set out as being the ones we should pursue. We're clean, obviously, to launch a consultation in, in January to seek views from those around the Chamber, and I would welcome suggestions from Mr Burnett as to how we can accelerate uh, to an earlier uh, finish point with the programme. But what he must also recognise is the implications there would be for inflation of individual interventions in, in households. It would drive up the cost if we haven't got supply chain in place to respond over that timescale. And we also need uh, to reflect the desire of local authorities and others to try and develop local economic opportunities, which I would think is something he would welcome. And it is also the case that this is not an isolation. We are continuing to invest heavily in our programmes in terms of area-based schemes that Mr Stewart leads on or in terms of the non-domestic uh, estate where we're investing uh, almost £30 million in this current year in non-domestic uh, interventions. So we're continuing to invest heavily £500 million over this lifetime of this Parliament. That's a significant public investment at a time when there is no equivalent scheme uh, in England. And I just point that out to Mr Burnett. Lewis MacDonald. Much, and I thank the Minister for advance height of his statement. He started by saying he was certain that 2040 was the right target date, but then said he wanted to consult again just to be on the safe side. I wonder if he can confirm that further consultation will only consider bringing the target forward and not pushing it further back. Uh, he also proposes to put local heat and energy efficiency strategies on a statutory uh, footing, uh, but didn't say anything really about how uh, those strategies would be supported. I welcome his commitment to talk to councils, but will he tell, when will he be able to tell Parliament and councils uh, what support will be there, what resources will be there uh, to support those strategies? Thirdly, I, I, I welcome his commitment uh, uh, to our proposal to regulate district heating, and I would ask him to confirm that that will enable district heating to be placed in local development plans. And finally, I think the case for permitted development rights and way leaves for district heating uh, has already been made and made strongly. Can he undertake to conclude his investigation into that matter as rapidly as possible so that uh, those provisions are already in place before regulation and licensing of this sector begins? Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'll, I'll try and get through these uh, if I can. Certainly in terms of the, the target date 2040, we, we do believe that 2040 is the right timescale, but we are, what we're trying to reflect, the point I'm accused of not doing on the part of Mr Burnett, is to reflect Parliament's sentiment on this and indeed other stakeholders who believe that we should be accelerating. So we are going to consult, and if we can come forward with a credible way of doing that, then that would be obviously the purpose of the consultation exercise. We do believe, though, uh, that there are competing uh, tensions here, that um, the faster you accelerate, the more difficult it is for the supply chain to 
respond if we have a, a long signal, uh, policy signal, and pr provide commitment to delivering the regulatory framework and follow through in that. That provides a very stable basis for b private business to invest. And, and bearing in mind the total cost of the programme may be up to £12 billion, pounds, the, neither the Scottish Government or local government can afford to commit that kind of resource to the issue. But what we want to do is track it, uh, track in and lever in as much private and third sector investment as we can. So these kind of long-term certainty, uh, long certainty that's delivered through LHEs in particular would be very uh, important in that process. So I think the, the LHEs process in which we're engaging with COSLA as a key partner in, in terms of delivering uh, Energy Efficient Scotland is to understand from them what it would take in terms of resource base to enable them to be able to deliver that. So we do recognise there are resource challenges. This is a new responsibility. Um, we, we don't have a bottomless pit of funding, as I'm sure Mr Macdonald would acknowledge, but we do want to have a sensible dialogue with our colleagues in COSLA and to date the discussions have been very constructive, so I welcome that. We're also looking at how we, in terms of providing the regulatory environment for district heating uh, and tackling issues such as way leaves, again, that provides investor confidence that they can deliver uh, uh, timescales cost effectively and reduce uh, financial risk and also project delivery risk, uh, which also helps with the cost of capital in terms of borrowing uh, from the private, for the private sector projects. So uh, happy to engage with Mr. McDonald. I'm sure my colleagues, Mr. Stewart, who leads on on the planning matters and indeed on, on the domestic front, would be, be keen to engage with opposition spokespeople on how we can actually deliver a consensus on this. Uh, we'll move to the open questions. There was a lot in these questions and answers. Can I ask members please to avoid statements and get straight to questions because I have a lot of requests. Uh, Gail Ross followed by Graeme Simpson. <clears throat> Thank you, President Officer. Can the Minister assure me that there will be a recognition of the different issues in rural areas and ensure flexibility and deliverability? Thank you. Paul Wheelhouse. I certainly ha can provide reassurance to Gail Ross. I mean, our programmes already do uh, take account of the varying costs of delivering energy efficiency measures in rural areas, and we are actively looking at where additional flexibility can be introduced. For example, we recently introduced new measures to our Warmer Homes Scotland scheme, including ground source heat pumps, micro hydro, micro wind, micro CHP, asbestos removal, installation of new and replacement LPG tanks, and replacement of exist existing unsafe oil storage tanks. These measures will be of, of clearly of particular help to households living in rural and island areas that are not served by the gas grid. And as I mentioned in, uh, earlier, we're trying to put a particular focus on helping those communities and individuals who are off the gas grid. We continue to work closely with uh, de local de delivery partners partners and are listening to their ideas as well. And I would also add from an island's perspective, we clearly are now in an environment where the Islands Act is now in force. And as we develop the Islands Community Impact Assessment Tool between now and the second half of next year, we'll hopefully be in a place to apply that to any of our future uh, proposals and projects. And of course, the same goes for answers. Graeme Simpson, followed by Alistair Allen. Thank you. Um, if the government's open to going faster quotes on meeting EPC targets, is it also open to going faster on dealing with fuel poverty than is suggested in the Fuel Poverty Bill? Paul Wheelhouse. Well, uh, clearly what we are trying to do through Energy Efficient Scotland route map is, is to tackle energy efficiency as a driver for fuel poverty. And while we are convinced that the timescales we set out in the route map are, are the correct ones, we believe they are right for the reasons I've given earlier, and not repeat those points, uh, we are obviously providing a consultation opportunity in January for those who have got credible proposals about how we can deliver the programme faster to do so. And that would help uh, tackle fuel poverty if we were to able to go faster than our, our plans outline. Now, my colleagues, uh, Mr Stewart and Ms Campbell, have laid out uh, a, a clear and uh, focused approach to tackling fuel poverty and the Fuel Poverty Targets Bill. And they were focusing on, as I said in my statement, on providing a solution that would leave fewer than 5% of households in fuel poverty by 2040. So there's parallel strands of work and we want to work with others in this chamber to tackle fuel poverty. Alistair Allen, followed by Jackie Bailey. Will the Minister agree that we need to tackle poor quality insulation, uh, installations from certain contractors claiming to be working under government or industry funded schemes, sometimes leaving vulnerable householders with no paperwork and no proper recourse to have the damage to their property fixed? While these issues appear to be mainly associated with UK government schemes, what more can the Scottish Government do to enhance consumer protection in this area? Paul Wheelhouse. Well, Dr Allen raises an extremely important point. I, I referenced the issue about uh, consumer protection in relation to district heating, but in terms of the wider investment that we are making as a government, we agree that it's imperative to protect householders when they're undertaking uh, work to improve their homes, to make them more energy efficient. 
and we are, through the Scottish Government-run energy efficiency schemes, already uh, placed, putting in place provisions to protect consumers. For example, the Warm, Warmer Homes Scotland contract requires installations to be completed to a high standard, and all measures are inspected to ensure they are completed to a high standard, something we wish was apl applicable in other schemes across the UK. But for local authority area-based schemes, all authorities are required to provide a quality assurance service, including access to a formal complaints process, on-site monitoring of the quality of the works and post-completion advice. And we're learning lessons from previous schemes and have established a short life working group on quality assurance, consumer protection and skills in the supply chain, which will report its recommendations shortly. Jackie Bailey, followed by Mark Ruskell. Presiding officer, can I declare an interest as the honorary vice president of Energy Action Scotland? The target is deeply unambitious. People are going to food banks right now asking for cold bags because they can't afford the fuel to cook a meal. Can the minister really ask them to wait until 2040 to put the cooker on? And why is the budget for energy efficiency just a quarter of what experts have said is required? Paul Wheelhouse. Well, I think, I think just to put things in respect to presiding officer, in this current year, we're spending over £146 million on energy efficiency. That is not lacking ambition. That's actual delivery on the ground. So in response to Jackie Bailey's point, I fully recognise there are individuals that are in a difficult situation and clearly we want to try and help those individuals as soon as we can. But to give Jackie Bailey assurance, we are investing right now and we're continuing to invest throughout this parliament in the, the schemes that are run through area-based schemes uh, that Mr Stewart leads on and also in terms of the wider tackling uh, of poverty and, and, and improving the living conditions of the people of Scotland. But I would just gently suggest Jackie Bailey to, not to scaremonger on this, we are continuing to invest. And even though uh, we're talking about a completion of a programme by 2040, we are prioritising in that route map, tackling households in fuel poverty in the earliest phases of that, uh, with the aim to get properties up to uh, EPC band B uh, by 2040 for those individuals. Mark Ruskell, followed by Liam McCarthy. Thank you. Uh, the UK government has put in place 320 million over the next three years to ensure a steady pipeline of district heating projects whereas in Scotland, 60 million must be shared between several types of renewable heat developments. Will the Minister seek evidence on how a steady funding stream for district heating can be put in place as part of January's consultation? Paul Wheelhouse. I certainly recognise the point uh, that Mr Ruskell makes. Clearly, uh, it would be in everyone's interest if we were able to provide long-term certainty about funding. And I know uh, the Finance Secretary, Mr Mackay, is, is looking at the issues in the, in the round, around the number of strands of government funding to try and provide as much uh, certainty going forward for, for investors and indeed the, the public and third sectors. So uh, certainly take that point seriously. I mean, obviously, uh, in the context of the budget on the 12th of December, hopefully Mr Ruskell uh, will be able to see more detail on these issues. Liam MacArthur, followed by David Torrance. Uh, thank you. Can I thank the Minister for early sight of his statement? The Minister said he's listening in relation to uh, the issues around fuel poverty. So did he hear the strong uh, criticism uh, from those giving evidence to the Local Government Committee yesterday about the failure of Ministers to include uh, a rural minimum income standard in the uh, new definition of rural fuel poverty and therefore risk uh, resources not being targeted to where they're most needed? And can he work with the uh, Housing Minister to ensure that the uh, bill is properly island-proof? So that those resources do indeed go to places like Orkney that has the highest level of fuel poverty. Paul Wheelhouse. Um, what, what I would say to I recognise the importance of the issue, not just in my, my energy capacity, but, but also as Islands Minister, these issues have been raised before. I know Mr Stewart and Ms Campbell are working very, very seriously to try and uh, invest strongly in, in housing provision in the islands and to ensure there is funding to tackle uh, schemes through the area-based schemes and working with the island authorities to try and fine-tune those schemes to make sure we are reflecting some of the dimensions locally that Mr, Mr MacArthur raises. But I would also point out that there is a high level of investment per intervention in each of the island areas. In fact, uh, I, I don't want to, to play about with numbers, but certainly uh, each of the island authorities are happy to supply the information that Mr MacArthur are, are receiving a very generous uh, 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 contribution from the Scottish Government to support energy efficiency. In the and of course, there are a number of pressures in island authorities which uh, across Scotland are indeed affected by matters which are out with our control. We can do what we can with the resources we have and the policy levers we have. We want to work with UK Government ministers to tackle fuel poverty as well and certainly work with the member in tackling the issues in Orkney Island. David Tordens, followed by John Scott. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Minister provide more detail on how a government will work with local authorities to ensure these ambitions are met? Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, local government is a key partner. I've alluded to this in my, in my statement in, uh, in respect to the delivery of energy efficient Scotland. And we already work very closely with local authorities right across Scotland, for example, in the delivery of our home energy efficiency programmes for, for Scotland, area based schemes, and an energy efficient Scotland transition programme. 
As I said in my statement, though, recently met with councillors Heddle and Witham, uh, calls as spokespeople for uh, environment, economy and community well-being, and discussed the local government's role in delivering energy efficiency in Scotland. There's a clear desire from those uh, representatives of COSLA to have a, a genuine partnership and to work in jointly uh, tailoring and uh, designing the Energy Efficiency Scotland programme. And we have agreed to strengthen our partnership and will establish a high-level strategic group which will embed our commitment to active partnership with local government, including shared risk and joint decision-making. John Scott, followed by Emma Harper. And firstly, my apologies to colleagues for arriving late for the Minister's statement. And, the Minister, and thank you, Presiding Officer, for calling me nonetheless and declaring it an interest as a farmer as well. And notwithstanding the, the Minister's assurances to Gail Ross, uh, he will be aware that the Energy Efficient Scotland route map does not adequately address the growing problem emerging in rural Scotland where low energy efficient housing stock creates fuel poverty and makes worse the growing mental health problems recently highlighted in the Ayrshire Post. What special measures is the Cabinet Secretary going to bring forward to deal with these interlinked and growing problems across rural Scotland, which cannot wait till 2040 to be resolved? Paul Wheelhouse. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, um, I, I'm not sure if, if Mr Scott caught this, but we, we are focusing on tackling off gas grid areas. That's one of our key priorities. So that clearly has a strong impact on rural areas. I certainly give the member undertaking that we are listening very carefully in terms of the, the route map, which was presented very much as an all Scotland document, but didn't make specific reference to the rural dimension. We are obviously clearly reflecting on that. Uh, clearly, we had assumed 100% of Scotland was covered by that programme, uh, but we need to, to reflect the, the local context in, in islands and rural areas. And as I outlined to Gail Ross, there are a number of ways in which we're doing that. I'm happy to engage with the member on issues in, in South Ayrshire uh, that affect his constituents, but I uh, want to reassure him we are very much focusing on tackling areas with high fuel poverty, many of them are rural areas, but also trying to tackle the particular uh, context which rural areas face as well. Emma Harper, followed by Alex Rowley. To ask the Minister how the plans announced support local economies and the development of supply chains. Paul Wheelhouse. I think the uh, presiding officer, principally through Energy Efficiency Scotland, we are putting in place a framework of standards um, helping to make it the norm to invest in energy efficiency, which helps drive the market. But we're also proposing to help create demand for energy efficiency improvements through the establishment of the local heat and energy efficiency strategy that I referred to. We believe strongly, based on the feedback we've had from business and, uh, in supply chain, that will be extremely helpful in providing uh, very invaluable market information also helping to facilitate cross-border projects where you have two different local authorities. We know in many areas such as Glasgow where you have suburbs which straddle the, straddle the boundary, there may be proposals for uh, local heat uh, projects, district heating projects, which may require that structure to provide investor certainty. And in reference to a point that was earlier on made by Lewis MacDonald, which I have uh, failed to refer to, th these documents could potentially have an important role in the planning process and uh, providing a, a structure to inform planning decisions as well. Alex Rowley, followed by John Mason. Presiding officer, the financial memorandum that accompanied uh, the fuel poverty bill published in June uh, only allows for additional administration costs. Yet we know that if we have to tackle the 24% of households now in fuel poverty in Scotland, then that budget is likely to double. Will the Minister look again at the financial memorandum that accompanies the, the, the fuel poverty bill and look at some realistic figures for tackling fuel poverty? Paul Wheelhouse. I would certainly direct um, uh, Mr Rowley to, to engage with my colleague Kevin Stewart on issues regarding the fuel poverty bill itself. But on the issue that he raises about the, the costs, perhaps in regards to the um, heat and energy, local heat and energy efficiency strategies, we are keen to have a dialogue, represent, realising this is a new responsibility potentially to be falling upon our, our partners in local government and want to have a, a, a genuine discussion with them about what the resource implications are, the balance between central and local resource that's required. Smaller local authorities obviously face greater challenge in delivering uh, new new functions uh, and so obviously we can take in that into account in deciding what structures are in place for energy efficient Scotland and look at how we joint, jointly govern that as well. And the last question is to John Mason. Hey, thank you. The Minister has mentioned uh, district heating and I just wonder if he can say how confident he thinks he is uh, based on the announcements he's made today that the private sector really will move up forward in, in more district heating which we've not seen a huge amount of so far. Paul Wheelhouse. Well, the, the member is absolutely right. We, we are learning from uh, jurisdictions like Denmark, where we've got a memorandum of understanding with the Danish government. Uh, in that country, district heating forms over half the heating market. 
uh, and has taken some time to develop so we can learn lessons from how they've achieved that. Realistically in Scotland we believe it may be uh, up to 20% uh, of housing stock may be suitable for district heating projects uh, and provision of local heat and energy efficiency strategies will send a really strong signal to the market about the investment opportunities by identifying those zones within each local authority which are most suitable for district heating uh, to, be, to be delivered. And in order to reduce barriers to development and provide conditions on the ground to grow the market we're investing, investigating how to put district heating onto the same footing as other utilities for instance uh, exploring as I say uh, permitted development rights and we leave uh, issues as well. So I hope uh, and I understand from the market uh, Scotland and London are way ahead in terms of their attractiveness to uh, private, private investors and I hope that can continue. That concludes questions on the statement on Energy Efficiency Scotland. We managed to get all requests granted and can I thank everyone for the way they conducted the session. We'll take a few moments to change seats.